Put aside the memory and be in the present moment. And then sit upright. You are already sitting upright, that is fine. And relax. Keep the body, mind relaxed. The shoulders are kept loose. Open the eyes and then close lightly. And spot a smile on the lips. I am in the heart the body, the mind, and myself. I am Be aware of the breathing process. That is how we encounter life with awareness. I know that I am breathing in and I know that I am breathing out. That is how there is harmony between awareness and life. I know that I am breathing in and I know that I am breathing out. You may notice there is no time in the breath. In life, there is no time. Be aware of the breathing in and the breathing out. Life is timeless, you can see that. Life is breath, and breath is timeless. I know that I am breathing in, and I know that I am breathing out.
that knowing, that awareness is also timeless. Then where is time? No time in breath, no time in the awareness. If mind enters in between, that is where time is located. When you are aware of the breath, thereby establishing a harmony between awareness and the breath. You have stepped out of the time. Time is bondage, and therefore you can experience the joy of freedom. As you are aware of the breath in and out. I am aware of the breath in and the breath out. And then there is the smile on the lips. And I can experience the joy of the harmony between awareness and life. You are entirely independent. You do not owe the awareness to anything other than yourself. You do not owe life to anything other than yourself. You do not owe the joy of harmony to anything other than yourself. That is freedom. In, out. In, out. Be aware of all the elements in the breath awareness. One, the harmony between awareness and breath or life. Two, timelessness. Three, the joy of freedom. Freedom from time. This is the state of Buddhahood. That is the Buddha in you.
harmony, timelessness, and the joy of freedom. There should be no distraction, but in case there is distraction, don't be annoyed, keep smiling, and tell yourself in, out, in, out, in, that takes away the distraction. In fact, it is not a distraction. It is a, an opportunity to be alert one more time. In, out. You can be aware of your breathing process anywhere, anytime. This relaxes the nervous system beautifully. Relax. Sit at ease. And relax. Slowly open the eyes. Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Harihe Om Shri Muruti Purana Namalayam Namame Bhagavat Pada Shankaram Loka Shankaram Jnana Kalusham Jeeva No We have done that. Om Sara Swapna Tulyohi Ragadveshati Sankulaha Vakale Satyavad Bhati Prabodhe Satya San Bhavet. I have a question. Huh? I have a desire to see the beautiful places like Grand Canyon, Alaska Glaciers, etc. 
Is that desire a binding one? I want to see the beauty of God's creation, not for uh, entertainment. You see, desire binds. Desire binds. Right? What is your experience? Suppose uh, you want to go to Alaska. Uh, how, how is uh, that desire, uh, that movement in you? You check yourself. How is that movement? You, I feel like going to Alaska. Okay? Immediately, there is a, a small tension in you. Then already the mind starts spinning. I have to book the ticket. And earlier the better. Okay? And then uh, what would be the expenditure? And so can I afford all that? Now who else will come with me? Can I go alone? So all of that will be there. All of that movement of the mind, it produces stress. Do you know, there is a thing called stress. All of you are aware of it. And, uh, what is the origin of stress, you know? What is the origin? The origin of stress is thought. Only that much. The very thought, nothing, nothing more than that, just the thought produces stress. It is like uh, you move the hand, a vibration is produced. The vibration may be very minute or very low frequency so that you don't hear. Or it may be of a higher frequency that you hear. But still, the very movement produces a vibration. Similarly, the moment a thought arises, there is a stress. That is how stress builds up. Fortunately, in our system, uh, Bhagavan created it that way. There is what is called parasympathetic nervous system. That uh, it works and uh, it, uh, it neutralizes that stress. This is how life goes on. You are producing stress and the system is neutralizing it. It is like you put uh, all kinds of food into the tummy. The, the physiology it uh, takes care of all of that. And uh, some of the undesirable things of the thing of the food that you eat, the physiology develops a, a mechanism to get rid of all of that. Therefore, it is working. Suppose you put a lot more food into the system. The system has to work uh, over time to neutralize all that. Uh, therefore, the same way it applies to the mind also. So as the mind is working and working and working, it produces a stress under the uh, the uh, parasympathetic nervous system has to work hard to reduce, the, to neutralize that stress. This is how life is going on. That, uh, that parasympathetic can handle certain amount of stress in a given time, in a given day. I give you a graph. The stress has gone up to that level. Now it is being brought down by the parasympathetic. Before it comes to the zero level, you put some more stress. And then the spike goes up. And before it, that again uh, the system works and tries to bring it down. Before it comes to anywhere middle or less than middle, again you put some more stress. Like that it will be spiking. And uh, therefore, uh, the very thought produces a stress. And if the thought is in the form of a groove, a scare, thought is uh, very neutral. It doesn't uh, hurt, uh, it doesn't produce this much stress. A little stress, which is uh, insignificant. But suppose the thought is a scare, you know, scare. Then uh, that produces a lot more stress. And uh, every desire is a scare in the mind. Every desire. And uh, in Gita we go to the extent of saying that 
even the desire for moksha you have to give up. We say that. Siddhya Siddhyo Samo Bhutva Tamatvam Yoga Uchiyate. There Bhashyakara says, even Siddhi there is moksha. My yoga will help you to gain moksha. That is Siddhi. And Asiddhi means you don't get moksha. So you should become equanimous towards moksha as well as bandha. Then only you are in yoga. That means even Shankara writes in so many words, even the desire for moksha, to begin with you have it, so that dharma, artha, kama are put aside. The desire for moksha, mumukshu, the desire for moksha helps you to put aside some, uh, cautiously, without any violence, uh, smoothly, you put aside dharma, artha, kama. And uh, that is the purpose of desiring moksha. Now you are established in the desire of moksha. Um, so do you want moksha or not? Yes. Then you give up that desire also. Because even that desire is a bondage. And uh, as long as you continue to desire moksha, you will not get moksha. Because your Swarupa itself is moksha. So by, by desiring moksha, you are denying moksha to you. You are denying yourself. Therefore, you have to give up that moksha also. Did you hear this statement? You have, you see, as long as you seek the truth, you won't get it. But only those who seek the truth get it. Did you hear that? You got the spirit of it? Therefore, even the desire for moksha, you have to gently put aside. This is where we stand. Because you have used the word desire to see something, that is that is not that is not acceptable. I cannot say no, no. That desire is not a binding desire. You go ahead and entertain it. I don't want to say that. Okay, because uh, the, I clearly see that any desire is a scare in the mind, and uh, that uh, hurts you. Suppose you say, it so happened that I am looking at Grand Canyon and I am amazed at the beauty of it. And it is uh, reflecting the glory of Bhagavan. Then you are perfectly alright. Therefore, if it happens, let it happen. Like Sedona, let it happen. No, I'm not stopping you. I'm encouraging you to go. Because I myself am not in a uh, point of coming to all these places. Therefore, after giving a thought, I have gently put it aside. But I'm encouraging you to go. Because you are here. and you, you It is not a desire or any such thing. One class we cancelled. We cancel it because I need a break. <laughs> Take it that way. Maybe you, you too need a break. And there is a car, there are roads, and it is so happening that uh, you travel there and see the beauty of it and come back. Do that, by all means. A similar thing you do with regard to Grand Canyon also. Now, Alaska, please do that also. But uh, don't make it convert it into a desire. If it has to happen smoothly, without exercising our will, if it has to happen, so take it as the will of the Supreme Power and allow it to happen. I prefer it to put it that way. Even the language should be perfect, you know, so that uh, the attitude is right, put in the right place. So I want to look at it that way. Okay. Samsaraha. You see, there is a word Jagat, and uh, sometimes it is called Samsaraha also. The words uh, have the meaning of uh, phenomenon in them. Jagat gachati iti Jagat. In English, the etymology we do not know. What is the etymology of the word world? We don't know it. 
But in Sanskrit, we know it. There must be some etymology. Really speaking, these languages, particularly English, etc., English, Telugu, etc., they are not etymological languages. There must be some etymology, but over a period, over a millennia, the etymology became obscure. The words got fixed. That is how these languages have developed. Whereas in Sanskrit, even today, the etymology remains. And it is known. And you can look for it. Uh, we have a saying in Sanskrit, in Vyakarana, every single word, without exception, is derived from a verbal root. Means what? That is the etymology. Even the word Atma is derived from a verb, Atta. So this way, the etymology is there. Jagat, Gechati, Iti Jagat. Dhatu is gum. Gum. It gets a doubled. And when you get doubling it, gum, gum. In the first gum, mu will go away. Only ga remains. And that gets changed to ja. Okay? Now you are like looking at Jagam. Anunasika Lopaha is a very good sutra is there. Anunasika Lopaha. And then uh, Hrasvasya Piti Kriti Tuk. Like that there is a sutra. Tugagama. So you get Jagat. Very, very clear. Jagat. So that means that which is constantly moving. That is the Jagat. That's why it is not just a word, it is phenomenal word. Okay? Now you attach yourself to Jagat. Then it becomes a samsara. If you do not attach, then it is not samsara. Only when you attach to the Jagat, it becomes a samsara. What do you mean by attaching to Jagat? So, the Jagat is moving. And so the events are happening. Even the person is an event only. When you meet the person, you come into contact with the person, all of these events only. A thing that is also an event, you come into contact with that thing, you start enjoying that thing. So these are all events. Therefore, though we say for the sake of understanding, things, people and events, that is how the Jagat now you attach yourself to things. Means some things make you happy and some other, then there is the opposite, opposite waiting there. Some others make you unhappy. Then uh, there are people, some, some of them make you happy and some others make you unhappy. Though the entire humanity remains neutral, but in your world, there is a small world around you. You create your own world, you know, that is created by you. Let us say the whole world is created by God, but you do not live in God's world. You create your own world and live in it. God did not create family for you, you created for yourself. Okay? Therefore, so that is the samsara. There is the jagat, and in that jagat, you create a samsara for yourself. Okay? And uh, this uh, samsara, you have to understand, uh, it is very complex. Sankulaha. The word sankulaha is a very interesting word. When you apply it to sound, sound, so, uh, and sometimes they apply it to battlefield. In the battlefield, somebody is releasing arrows, somebody is fighting with a sword, in the old-fashioned battlefield, somebody is uh, fighting from elephant, sitting on the elephant, somebody is fighting on the horse, somebody is, is a charioteer, somebody is fighting, sitting in the chariot, somebody is using a mace to kill the enemy. So all possible ways of arms are used and all kinds of fighting is going on. Some foot soldiers are also there, they are fighting with their spears, etc., this kind of a very complex battle it is. In Sanskrit we call it Sankula Samaraha. That is where the word Sankula is used. And if you go to the market, suppose you go to the market, 
you hear a, a certain amount of sound. They measure the amount of sound also. They say decibels. 100 decibels of sound is there. They say 100 is not good for health. It should be less than that. But in the market it will be 100 and above. And what kind of sound it is? Are it is not a particular sound. It is a mix of all kinds of sound. It is called Sankula Dhpani. That is the word Sankula. Sankula means very complex. Like noodles, you know. Very complex. Sankula. And uh, what is the, how the uh, samsara means your world? It is Sankula. Means very complex. Nothing is simple in that. Everything is complex. Okay? And uh, what kind of complexity? Ragadvesha, the Sankula. You get attached to people, to things, to events, that attachment. Okay? And then attachment breeds fear. Vesha, Vesha. So fear means whatever causes fear to you, you, you hate it. You are averse to it. Therefore attachment produces averse, aversion. Then a few other things will follow. Okay? So Kama is the beginning. Kama. You see there are six enemies. And their captain is Kama. The captain of these six enemies is Kama. Then he has a lieutenant close to him. That is Krodha. Kama Krodha. Kama Eshaha Krodha Eshaha. Now, the corresponding synonyms are Raga Dvesha. Kama is called, Kama is Raga. Krodha is Dvesha. Adi, jealousy, etc. Frustration, why not, what not. So, first we have to examine our attachment. Because uh, the Jagat doesn't bind you as much as the samsara you create out of the Jagat binds you. Okay? You see, uh, suppose uh, there are uh, things in the world, they don't bind you. You want to convert them to your advantage, then the bondage begins. Attachment. People have, uh, uh, in their ignorance, they try to give importance to this attachment, and they want to have it. So, they give a name, they, they don't use the word attachment, because attachment is bondage, you can see the word has that meaning. Therefore, what they do, they give a nicer word, call it, call, call it love. <laughs> that is how they call it. And then uh, they will be using the word love, 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 love all the time. But uh, is that love? What is love? Mostly it is attachment. So can I examine this issue? Ragadveshadi Sankulaha. So, generally, human beings do not have a sense of love. Okay? What they have is not love. And so we should know why we are unable to love also. So, love is like a the, fra the fragrance to the rose, the fragrance to the rose, love is uh, to the heart, love is to the heart as fragrance to the rose. Okay? And that fragrance of love, it is absent in human existence, unfortunately. It, it is there, but it doesn't come out. It is always suppressed. Because of uh, the attachment. And uh, you see, you say love, but you examine that love, is it associated with the desire or not? 
if it is associated with desire, then it is not love anymore. It becomes attachment. And people give examples. The child, child, I have to say child. The child loves the mother. They say that. Now, we are a bit harsh in these, these situations. And uh, you see, in Vedanta also, uh, people started uh, appeasing the audience. The Acharyas, they, they have developed this process of appeasing the audience because they want the audience to be amused. They want to amuse the audience. I see this a lot. I have a lot of experience in this. Somehow, I never try to amuse the audience. I, I, I am happy when people enjoy the class. Of course, I am happy. And if the people are not able to enjoy the class, I cannot be happy because something is missing in what I am doing. So I have to improve myself. Therefore, that is the game that I have to play. But uh, this appeasement policy, I don't follow. You see, some of them are accustomed to a, a kind of Vedanta. Uh, they know that Vedanta, they were studying it for a decade or two, and then they suddenly walk into my class and feel aghast. Hey, what kind of a teaching is this? He seems to be different. Or he seems to be weird. <laughs> Not different. Weird. That is how they feel. Huh? For example, uh, an elderly couple came to my class. They were, just I am giving you an example, they were listening to a kind of Vedanta in which they were told, you are the grandpa, grandma, you have to take care of your grandchildren and they will come up and you have to bring them into our religion, our culture and you have to teach them our language. Otherwise, they will be spoiled in this America, you know, outside. Outside culture is very dangerous. It is very addictive and it is very bad. You have to bring... Then why are you here? <laughs> huh? And uh, you have to... They are exposed to that outside culture. You have, Before you sending these children outside, they have to be immunized. That immunization job the parents are unable to do because they are running to their jobs. It is now the job of the grandma and grandpa, they have to do it. This is the kind of, so you have to teach them uh, chant of verses. As if if you chant uh, a few verses daily, the person is immune and now he is not influenced by the outer culture. That is the belief. And you have to teach them values, our values, not other values. <laughs> All divisive thinking, fragmentary thinking, having come here, this is the Vedanta to which they were uh, exposed for two decades. Then they come to my class, one class, two classes. Then they could not control their anguish and told me, what are you talking? What is this Vedanta? This appears to be very weird. So, then I have coined, when my Vedanta is weird, I have a name for the other Vedanta also. <laughs> and I have named it, christened it as Country Club Vedanta. Okay? So, you have Country Club Vedanta, now you have a weird Vedanta. So, this is how, in the name of Vedanta, what people push forward is culture, and religion. That is what they push forward. The teachers, the Acharyas, they push forward the culture and religion. And uh, they, they tell uh, that culture and religion, they give the name Vedanta to that. Okay? Not entirely. There are worthy exceptions. But this happens. And therefore, some of these things, when they are examined through and through, that makes people disturbed and aghast. 
to make that uh, that couple who came i told you know they persisted with my classes they should have gone away it is a one 10 day camp one week they were uh, by two days they were aghast but uh, they stayed third day fourth day fifth day sixth day seventh day they stayed and at the end uh, they asked uh, the organizer we want to say something generally for a one week camp we don't do that we don't encourage for three for 10 weeks or seven weeks we encourage it but not for one week but they wanted it then uh, i said okay do it so they came and told we are very happy that we have attended this camp some of our misconceptions are gone so there was a transformation so therefore you have to look at these things rather cautiously sometimes they may sound a bit odd if not weird but you have to examine you have to think about it you have to examine okay it is said that the child loves the mother child loves the mother <laughs> child what it knows what do you mean child loves the mother i have a feeling the child loves its meals <laughs> that is how i feel okay <laughs> but these are things are not so good to tell you know because uh, you enter into a family and tell such things uh, they will be disturbed <laughs> hey what is this uh, spoiled sport guy like that therefore uh, the child uh, um, uh, loves its meals i suppose okay that's why it seems to love the mother <laughs> is it loving the mother or is it uh, attached to its meals instinctively we don't know then you say mother loves the child okay now mother loves the child it's okay is it, we have to examine that also because uh, you look at look at the world uh, the animals love their babies the animals uh, love their babies eh? and uh, this movement loving the baby it has come to the humans from the animals in evolution millions of years of evolution is there because of which this uh, loving the babies it has come to humans from the animals right uh therefore uh, it is an instinct you call love the mother's love for the child it may be an instinct rather than love <laughs> so i have now dismissing even mother's love also uh, because uh, you cannot say animals uh, have uh, so much understanding and love and all that animals are instinctive instinct it is so instead of saying love you better say instinct it came from the animal and it is carried through into the humans okay and uh, that uh, instinct it is there and uh, we have to say it is attachment only because it is instinct it is attachment only only thing is the animal brings up its cubs or its babies up to a certain age and then forgets about them the instinct is over okay whereas uh, with human beings uh, there is a tremendous care care the word care people have a uh, they have a, a tendency to like these things i am i am very attached to you it is considered as a qualification and i care for you okay that is uh, i care for you it is considered a very um, uh, charitable thing in the world okay but don't you see the divisiveness there i am superior to you you are inferior to me you need my care and i am great enough or big enough in heart that i am giving my care to you that kind of a divisiveness is inherent in it don't you see that it is like uh, the humanity is divided into the noble and the ignoble and the noble go and serve the ignoble 
so you give some wonderful good sounding names to all that care i care to you but did you hear the word look at these care worn faces you did the, hear that word therefore i am not sure whether care is such a wonderful thing okay you want it to be good that is okay you want it to be good but it may not be as good as you want it to be uh, therefore uh, there is a tremendous care on the part of the parents towards their uh, babies till they are 3 years then they are 4 years then they are 5 years the parents continue to nurse them animals won't do that animals <laughs> maximum in months only not years this thing is among humans only even after 5 years you look after them you clean the kids you cuddle the children you hold them right now sometimes it uh, feels the children are like a plaything for the parents are they deriving some kind of an entertainment out of these kids the parents they don't call it uh, they don't call the children a plaything because it is not nice word you know <laughs> but probably if you carefully examine the child child becomes a plaything i have seen i am examining the human movement nothing more than that i am not condemning anything did you notice it i am just saying uh, any of this doesn't deserve the word love that is what i am trying to say all of this falls into the category of attachment only that is what i am looking at what i have noticed eh, there is a mother uh, she goes to job she makes good money and so she goes to job and uh, she gave birth to a child in fact two of them siblings with a gap of one year or one and a half years which is fine and then there is family planning and all that that is fine two children and uh, she employed a nanny in sanskrit we call it dhatri nanny we can say so she employed a nanny in india you can employ because the labor comes cheap here you have to employ a nanny it may cost uh, almost the entire salary of uh, that you make right in india it is cheap here uh, even uh, i have seen in mcdonald the other day i felt like joining a mcdonald <laughs> because i have a paperwork is there i do have paperwork still i don't know where i will lose it but as of now i am still holding on to it therefore i can put my papers there and they will uh, because they are uh, willing to pay 16 dollars per hour <laughs> and a free food and in between free time that is good <laughs> i can i felt like uh, joining very attractive and uh, then eventually insurance social service all those things will come and uh, so it is very attractive really speaking anyway in india that's uh, it's very costly 16 dollar per hour uh, in one hour how many uh, customers uh, the person will be able to serve uh, so not more than 3 or 4 or 5 max because every customer takes a 10 minutes time huh? that is all they can serve and uh, still it 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 works for them must be working for them but in india it comes very cheap there we don't count in hours we don't count in days also we don't count in weeks also we count in months so even if you jack up the price due to inflation and all that still it will remain cheap because you are counting in months not hours a count in hours becomes uh, it, it goes very high so it comes very cheap and so she employed a dhatri a nanny the nanny she goes to office at 9:30 comes back at 6 
in between the nanny struggles with these children and the first thing she comes back she comes to the children children are not going to her she comes to the children and she asks the she gives her some and uh, some uh, menial job some cleaning job to the nanny nanny goes away nanny should not linger nanny goes away and will do some cleaning of the table this and that the mother spends some reasonable time with the children and the children has to oblige her and the nanny also has to oblige her this i noticed then it occurred to me maybe the children are a plaything for her it is very clear but uh, the same philosophy or the same conclusion can be extrapolated even for a home keeping mother <laughs> okay <laughs> so the children become a plaything and they consider it as a love but is it love hmm? very difficult so and then the children grow up now the children are sent off to the school okay and uh, to a, sometimes to a boarding school that is also possible so the parents are now gradually pushing away the children you see this eh? and uh, so i am asking i am not saying anything i am asking is that all love the entire thing i have described eh? is that all love so t- taking the children as plaything for some time and then pushing away them to the school or even to a boarding school so is that all love when i ask this question i know the mothers would say how can you say such a thing they, they may say to me how can you say such a thing how can you ask such that question we have so much love for our children no i am not saying anything i am only inquiring so i am not saying yes or no okay i am only inquiring together with all of you so because uh, the love is a very extraordinary thing it is and what is this love so when a mother or when the parents love their baby if you look at it carefully the so called love of the parents towards the child so is it not for a very short period eh? it is there very for a short period and even in that short period i have raised a few questions right or do you see the same love right through life it seems to be not there right through life it seems to be there only when uh, they are uh, plaything their children they are uh, in a given age maybe up to 5 6 after that push them to school and then uh, they grow up they get married and then they grow up for that they make their own money they make their own family now the same law, it, it is still the same law is it there all through life therefore uh, so we have to question even that doesn't seem to be the love that seems to have all kinds of limitations so the mother and the father they separate themselves from children and the children separate themselves from the parents and they go off so if you examine the whole relationship from birth of the child to to the later parts of life when the children have now grown up etc it all comes out as attachment only it doesn't come out as nothing more than attachment so the parents are attached to the children and uh, is that attachment love is that love hmm? it looks like uh, the parents get something from their children and the children get something from their parents that is how it looks like therefore uh, <laughs> it cannot be love 
<laughs> How can that be? Love. Uh, you see, I am not saying uh, this should not continue like this. It should continue the way it is. Because if the parents don't give affection, if the parents don't care, the child withers. It is a well-known fact. Therefore, this should continue. That is how the nature is. It is there in the animals also, in a, for a short period. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, this should continue. It continues. Who am I to say should continue or should not continue? It continues in the world. But generally, the parents have their own problems, their own anxieties, their own fears, sorrows, and worries. I will tell you a general rule. When a person is uh, burdened with anxieties, sorrows, fears, problems, uh, etc., et the person is not free. And when the person is not free, he doesn't know what is love. Because freedom and love go together. I can love all of you only when I am free. To tell you very bluntly, I love all of you. Why? Because I am free. Why am I free? Because I don't have anything to push your way. And I don't seek anything in particular from you. Don't count bhiksha in it, okay? That is the freedom. And I seem to have that freedom. Therefore, I love you. Can you say that? Uh, uh, it is not about I. Just I told you how love has to be understood. You cannot say this with reference to parents versus children. You cannot say this. Because parents get something from the children. And children get something from the parents. It is, you don't need a big uh, uh, thing. Uh, to, it is not rocket science also. It can be easily understood. The parents and the children, when they grow up, they both grow up and they fight with each other. And therefore now the if it is love, there cannot be any fight. Love cannot have the... Love doesn't have opposite. These three things do not have opposites. Atma is existence absolute. Therefore, the opposite non-existence doesn't apply. Atma is a chit absolute, awareness absolute. Therefore, not being aware doesn't apply to Atma. Because it is absolute. Atma is love. Ananda is love. Absolute. Which means the opposite of love doesn't exist in Atma. There is no opposite to Sat, Chit and Ananda. They don't exist. Sat, Chit, Ananda, they are absolute. The opposite exists only when it is relative. Relative means conditional. Remove the condition, that also gets removed. Therefore, the opposite comes into picture. Therefore, uh, you see in the context of parents and children, they say love, but then uh, the opposite seems to be there. They start fighting with each other also, even uh, sometime or the other. Therefore, when you have the opposite, uh, how can you call it uh, love absolute? It is not love. It is attachment only. This Shankara knew. That's why he said, in a very nonchalant way, he said, Kate Kanta Kaste Putraha Samsaroya Mativa Vichitraha you talk big things. Kanta is the one who is loved. That is the word Kanta. It is a very significant word. He is not saying who is your wife. He is saying who is your beloved. That is what he is saying. Kate Kanta. Kanta is the beloved. Kamyate it Kanta. So you claim big, big, you make big, big claims. She is my Kanta. Like that. What Kanta? And then what putraha? Putraha, there thrai, the, the word thrai implies protecting. So he is supposed to protect you. 
what putraha, what protection he will give to you. And what he, he, he will not give any protection to you, you do not get any protection from him. What putra you are talking about? Then he says, samsaroya mativa vichitraha. Because uh, there is no kanta, there is no putra. But people talk all the time, all their life, they talk of kanta and putra. These are very weird people, Appa. That is what he says. <laughs> so for him, the samsara looks very weird. He was vichitra. Very funny. Uh, if, if it is funny, it is funny if there is no sorrow. Therefore, the blessed thing, it is not even funny. Because it comes with an enormous burden of sorrow. So, what love? It is all attachment. Now, did I explain the word Ragadvesha, the Sankula? That is the point. Ragadvesha, the Sankula, it is. So, I tell you, Sir, tell us what is love. Some, some, there must be some way of understanding the love, you know. Eh? So, we considered all possible situations and mostly dismissed every one of them. And uh, superficially appear as love, but they are not love. Then what is love? You should approach this love a bit negatively. Instead of trying to approach it positively, you approach it in a negative way. So you say, the parents love the child. child. So, but then the parents are against the child also. They push away the child to the boarding school, at least in the beginning. They say, no, no, for their own benefit we are doing it. That is okay. What do you mean by benefit? So in this samsara, what is benefit and what is loss? Therefore, you are having so much conditioning that you want to be a proud father. I want to be the father of an engineer or a doctor. In India, all parents have only one goal in life. And they go to all temples and perform all worships and all rituals and we swamis help them in doing all these things. They have only one goal. He has to be a proud father. When will he be proud father? When his son is either an engineer or a doctor. Then he is the proud father. Now, is he, is he loving himself or is he loving the son? Very difficult to say. Therefore, we say, attachment is not love. Let us start negatively. So, this positive thing doesn't work. Okay? So, attachment is not love. So, but many parents think that way. They think that uh, the attachment they have is love. And then, uh, did you notice this? They consider, people consider jealousy as love. You see, Ravanasura is jealous of Rama. If you see Sundarakanda and all that. Ravanasura is jealous of Ram. He uses all abusive language against Ram. But he never faces Ram. He could go when Rama is around and push aside Rama and Lakshmana and grab Sita and bring her openly. Who will stop him? Will anybody take him to court of law or what? What is it that stops him? You know what is it that stops him? He is afraid of Rama. If you see Ramayanam, he never stood before Rama. He makes an elaborate scheme to wean Rama away from that uh, hut. And when Rama is taken away a long distance, long enough distance, that he will not come back within five ten minutes. He cannot. That much distance he was weaned away by Maricha. Then he comes down and goes to her, and without losing time, because he is afraid. That if Rama comes back, Maricha told him, 
If Rama manages to target you, you will not live. That is all that is needed. He has to target, he has to stretch his arrow, he has to stretch his bow and mount the arrow and target you and release the arrow. That is the end of your life. You cannot live anymore. And Ravana was convinced. Therefore, he is afraid of Rama. And he wants, uh, he wants Sita's ascent. He wants to uh, uh, be his uh, lover. Uh, he has love for her. He considers it as love. And uh, he fails to understand why she still loves this Rama, useless guy. And he uh, he wants her love for himself. But she loves Rama. And he is jealous of Rama. And that jealousy is considered love. I gave an extreme example. Okay? You look at parents. I am coming back to parents. Look at parents. They are jealous of their neighbor's children. If my son gets a fourth rank, I am happy when I see the fifth rank, sixth rank, seventh rank people. But when I see the third, second and first rank people, I have jealousy. Why jealousy? Because I love my child. <laughs> Therefore, uh, you cannot say jealousy is love. No, jealousy is not love. Attachment is not love. Many people think that jealousy is love. Then, uh, conflict, if there is conflict, that is not love. So, if you assert, that is not love. A sense of uh, asserting your will upon the other person, that is not love. So, none of these things are love. So, when you dominate the other person in the name of love, that is not love. When you impose your idea upon the other person, that is not love. Like, uh, do you do, did you come across any parents who tell their children, you find out what God is? Did any parent tell that? No. What they do? They believed a God because their parents believed it and grandparents believed it. And they will rebuke him if they if he doesn't believe himself. Therefore, that is how they believed in a God. And they do the same thing to their children. They fix a God in the mind of the child. Before the child is exposed to the world, the child should not go into the world with an open mind. Because if he goes into an open mind, some other God may come into that mind. You have to make it closed. That mind. So prepare the child in such a way that the mind is shut and send into the world. Now, is that you call it love? You are conditioning the child, you are dominating the child, even psychologically, not only physically, psychologically, you don't call it love. When you dominate your children, or you dominate your wife, or even husband, <laughs> when you dominate, huh? So, or your girlfriend, you dominate. Or the, the lady, girl dominates the boyfriend. So, you possess the children. The parents possess the children. So, you see, the parents say, my child. You hold the child as mine. Is that love? So, none of these things are love. When all these things are put aside, then what remains? What remains? Atma remains. Nothing else remains. The awareness pure remains. That is love. And that you don't find in samsara. In samsara you find only attachment, Aversion, jealousy, domination, possession. That's why it is very sankula. Very complex it is. The samsara. And first you have to develop vairagya. 
and uh, when you become dispassionate then slowly the love starts uh, the fragrance of love it starts coming out only when you are dispassionate because when you are dispassionate you become free from all these things attachment aversion and all that all these complex uh, set of emotions ragadvesha adi sankulaha you come become free of all that and then that uh, freedom is there in you out of that freedom the fragrance of love it is the fragrance of atma atma is freedom atma is love and that fragrance it comes out it can happen to parents also it can be there to parents also it is not that parents are not uh, the only sanyasis can have it and not like that is when sanyasis are trying to possess and uh, possess their flock uh, what is love is there in love in it the sanyasis are like that they once uh, you go to a sanyasi to class the person should not go to any other sanyasi's class that is that you call it love therefore when there is possessing dominating and uh, trying to impose your ideas on the other person you curtail the other person's freedom through your uh, psychologically so all of that none of it is love when all of that raga dvesha etc is dismissed as unreal then what remains is love therefore you have to approach love rather in a negative way instead of trying to approach it in a positive way raga dvesha ati sankulaha we'll come back to it again just i will conclude the class by answering one question the question is about karma yoga let me finish this question ha so the question is karma yoga is doing karma with ishvara arpana buddhi that is without the attachment to, to karma or karma phala is my understanding correct you see people have acquired some terminology and they use the terminology and assume that it is the truth the terminology is not the truth so doing karma with ishvara arpana buddhi is karma yoga what is ishvara arpana buddhi uh, then doing karma um, uh, doing worship of god these rituals are there uh, performing those rituals is karma yoga uh, because you are worshiping god so this is how a kind of a, um, a, a kind of a posturing is there and then some terminology is also associated with it all of that has become uh, acquired the title karma yoga it is not like that so you should be very careful about it and uh, karma and karma phala the the relation also you should know i will explain briefly you do karma and only you know karma you do not know karma phala karma phala comes next birth or it may come in this birth also but when it comes you do not know that it is the karma phala of this karma first you have to accept some of the basics you there is karma before you okay karma phala is not before you it is only a promise that if you do this puja you will get that result it is a promise and it is a belief and it is a, not there before you and when it comes before you you can never understand that this karma phala is the result of that karma therefore even this expression this statement that accept the result with equanimity is karma phala is also a questionable statement it is because the result will be in the form of sukha or dukha and you cannot connect that result with the karma which gave you that sukha or dukha you cannot connect it you say somebody got uh, some illness 
and there must be some bad karma in the life, therefore the illness came. What is that bad karma, you tell me? You don't know. Therefore, first of all, you have to understand, karma is all that is there in your hand. In the, your hand means that is all that you know. You do not know anything about karma phala in the sense that that karma phala, when it comes, why it comes, and when it comes, this is connected to this karma, that kind of knowledge you don't have. So first, you make this very clear. Okay? Suppose karma phala is always in the form of sukha or dukkha. It doesn't have a third form. Only sukha or dukkha. That is the karma phala. And acceptance of sukha and dukkha with equanimity, that is not uh, that is not the point in the context of karma yoga. That is not the point. That equanimity that comes under vairagya and all that. Uh, so uh, that takes you to a higher level of vision, and uh, that Ishvara gives sukha or dukkha. Therefore, I accept it. That is not part of this karma situation. Okay. That is a great virtue, you hold on to that. That is equanimity, it is a great virtue, it will take you to the self-knowledge also, you hold on to that. Okay? And then put it aside. Having understood that, you put it aside. Now you are doing karma. Okay? You are with the karma. Stop talking so much about karma phala and all that. You are doing karma. Now what is the motive for this karma? Okay? To gain something whatever that something may be. It is a promise and it will come in the future and when it came, you will not be able to connect to this karma. Okay? Therefore, can you put aside the very idea of gain from your mind? Karmanyeva adhikaraste adhikaraha sambandhaha You connect yourself to the karma. Totally take out the very idea of phala for your mind. That is the statement. Now, I am concluding. Now you examine that statement. Even without thinking about the phala, can you undertake a karma? If the answer is yes, that becomes a karma yoga. Okay? Now, suppose you are worshipping God of wealth. Let us say. Okay? Can it become karma yoga? No. Suppose you make a posture. I am worshipping God of wealth without expecting any wealth from the God. And whatever wealth comes, I will accept it as Ishwara Prasada. Now, that becomes a Karma Yoga. It has become a posture of Karma Yoga. Right? Are I don't worship the God of wealth. That becomes a Karma Yoga. I worship the God of truth not the God of wealth, that is Karma Yoga. So, the moment you come to Karma Yoga, the entire gamut of Kamya Karmas is out of the window. Now there are no Kamya Karmas in your life. Should I say there are no Nishiddha Karmas in your life? No. Because when there is a Raga, you do Karma, which is wrong Karma, that is Nishiddha Karma. When there is Raga, you do Kamya Karma, which is a legitimate action, that becomes a Kamya Karma. When uh, even Kamya Karmas, you are about to give up. Where is the question of Nishiddha Karmas? So the question doesn't arise. Therefore, in your life, there are no Kamya Karmas, much less Nishiddha Karmas. Only Nitya Karmas are left, and Naimittika. And they are done without any thought of result. There will be result, but you do not get connected to the result. Without any thought of result, you do that karma. That becomes karma yoga. Okay? A brahmachari came to me. His mother is not doing well. I said, the study can wait. The Vedanta, the Vyakarana, they will not go anywhere. They will be there. You go and serve your mother. He said, okay. He went and served his mother as long as she lived. And then she died. So, that is Karma Yoga. Because he is doing karma, he is not, he doesn't even think of what I will get out of it. 
that is karma yoga therefore you are worshiping god of wealth and you want it karma you want to assume that it to be karma yoga you worship the god for power and uh, whether god gives me power or not i will accept it but i am worshiping the god for power that is not karma yoga you worship god uh, seeking anything and there is a motive that is not karma yoga the motive supremely matters and therefore now karma yoga is a proper righteous action which is uh, performed without any motive such a disinterested action the right action alone becomes karma yoga om purna namada purna vidam om shanti 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 hey